theorem prime m. Now, we saw earlier that Fermat's theorem states the following, that a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p, where p is a prime. Now, I hope to show that a is congruent to phi of m, and I'll define this function in a minute. Phi of m, this is congruent to 1 mod m for any m, uh, where m is not necessarily prime. And importantly, when m is prime, phi of m should equal p minus 1, which it does. Now, phi of m is the number of integers, number of integers, relatively prime, relatively prime to m. And what relatively prime means, consider x that is relatively prime to m. What, what this means is that the GCD of x and m is 1. And I, I claim this, this. And I'm going to use a similar outline of the proof we did earlier, just um, applying it to any, any mod. Now, the problem, if we try to just directly apply, we, we did two things. First, we showed that, uh, and I'm going to substitute m minus 1 for p minus 1, just to, um, and effectively m for p, just to um, initiate the generalization. We, we, we showed that this is just a permutation. It's a permutation of the residues. It's a permutation of the residues mod m. It's a permutation of that. Now, the reason that this is not going to be possible is that for, for non-prime m is con uh, uh, if, if, if that were the case, then we would have, like, consider two of them that are the same. We would say Ka is congruent to Ja mod m. Now, since A was relatively prime to P at that point, we could have just divided by A. But in this case, it does not imply, does not imply, it does not imply that K is congruent to J mod m. And here is where we have a problem, because we cannot divide by A, because A is not necessarily relatively prime to M, because M is not prime. So, that's the first problem. The second problem is, assume that were the case. Now, assume that it was the case that, you know, that, that these, that this, this product is congruent to A1 a2, uh, a m minus 1. Assume this was the case. Then we couldn't divide by m minus 1 factorial. This is mod m. We couldn't divide by m minus 1 factorial because this is not necessarily relatively prime. To m. So we have a bit of a problem. And what we do do, what we can do, instead of considering the numbers from 1 to m minus 1, we can consider the numbers less than m, but relatively prime to m. So instead of, that wasn't a very straight line, instead of, instead of considering those numbers, consider the numbers 1, r2, or sorry, r1, r2, r3, all the way up to m minus 1. And this is, call it s, the set of numbers relatively prime to m. Now, importantly, m minus 1 is always relatively prime to m, because this can be shown by the Euclidean algorithm. Um, by the Euclidean algorithm, the GCD of m and m minus 1 is equal to the GCD of m, and uh, these two subtracted, which is 1, which is clearly 1. So um, that, that shows that m minus 1 is relatively prime to m. Now to show that, uh, that, that this is a permutation of some sort, we can do the following. Now consider a times 1, this, this set, a times r1, a times r2, a times r3, all the way up until a times m minus 1. Consider this set S prime. Now, we claim that S prime is just a permutation of S. And this is clear, because if Ka is congruent to Ja mod m, 
then we would have k congruent to j mod m, which cannot be the case, and we can divide because a is now relatively prime to, to, to m in, in this case. Uh, since, since we're considering a relatively prime, so k a is congruent to j a mod m implies that k is congruent to j mod m. And since sets have unique elements, and there are no, uh, there are no, there are no equivalent elements in set S, this is just a permutation of this. S prime is a permutation of S. Now, what this means is that the product of S prime is congruent to the product of the elements of S mod M, and specifically that A times R1 A times R2 A all the way up until m minus 1a is congruent to 1 times r1 times r2 all the way up until m minus 1 modulo m. And the, the beauty of this is we can, we can divide by this because each of 1, r2, r, r1, 1, r1, r2 up to m minus 1 is relatively prime. So clearly the product is as well relatively prime to m, relatively prime, clearly m minus 1 times 1 times the product of r sub i, this just denotes the product, is also. Which means that we can just divide by r1 times r2 times r3 times m minus 1. Which, which gives us a times a times a times a times a all the way up until a is congruent to 1 mod m. Now the question, how many a's are these? How many, how, what's the exponent of a? And this is given by the phi function, the number of numbers relatively prime to m. Because the number of, because this, this is, can be mapped to 1, this can be mapped to r1, this can be mapped to r2, and so on, until this can be mapped to m minus 1. So this, in effect, is a to the phi of m, where phi of m is the number of numbers congruent, sorry about that, <laughs> the number of numbers congruent, the number of numbers relatively prime to m, sorry, not congruent, but relatively prime to m. And just to be clear, phi of m, number of integers relatively prime to m. Right. And now you might be wondering, how can you calculate phi of m? Now I'll I'll give this as an exercise that that if 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 you want to prove it, it's actually quite a difficult proof, but it's a very instructive proof um, that phi of m n is multiplicative. And what this means is that phi of m n is equal to phi of m times phi of n, sorry, phi of n, where the GCD of m and n is 1, or m and m are themselves relatively prime. So I'll just use this as uh, a lemma, and I can, I'll give it to you as an exercise to prove. This is our lemma. This is lemma one, and then lemma two and this is to, we're trying to prove a, an expression. We're going to prove the validity of an expression to give phi of m in closed form. Now lemma two is that phi of p to the k, where p is some prime, is equal to p minus 1 times p to the k minus 1. And why is this the case? Well, between 1 and p, there are p minus 1 numbers not divisible by p. Between p plus 1 and 2p, there are p minus 1, and, and so on. And so, in effect, there are P minus p to the k minus one sets of p integers, each containing p minus one integers relatively prime.
to p for a total of p to the k minus 1 times p to the p minus 1 numbers relatively prime to p. So v of p to the k is the following. Now we can come up with an expression for v of m, for any m. So v of m is equal to v of, and m is has a standard prime factorization. Prime 1 times exponent 1 times prime 2 times exponent 2 all the way up to prime k times exponent k. And this is a standard and unique, unique factorization by the fundamental theorem of algebra. Now, by the previous theorem, we know that this is a product of these k, these k factors when we take phi of m. Now, we know that each of these are relatively prime. Each of these factors are relatively prime because they are, they're, are, they're, they're its own prime raised to some exponent. So clearly, they can't share a factor. So phi to the m is equivalent. And this is, this is, this is an amazing result, amazingly powerful. Phi to the p1 e1, to p2 to the e2, all the way up to, maybe I should continue down here. Um, as a consequence of my my ebullient penmanship over here, <laughs> times p oh sorry times phi of p sub k to the e k e e sub k. It's a subscript, not a factor. And we know each of these, right? We know that phi to the p k for any prime in exponent k is p1 minus 1 times p to the e1 minus 1. And a nicer way to write this, a much nicer way of writing this, is p1 to the e1 times 1 minus 1 divided by p1. And Upon multiplying this, you can show that this is indeed the case. And there's a reason we're factoring out p1 to the e1. And you'll see that you'll see why in a minute. So iterating this, applying this to every single prime to the exponent, we get that v of m is equal to p1 to the e1 times 1 minus 1 over p1 times p2 to the e2 times 1 minus 1 over p2 all the way up to pk to the ek times 1 minus 1 over pk. Sorry if that's not clear. It should be p sub k to the e sub k. And multiplying this, we have this is equal to m. Why is this equal to m? Well, each of these factors, each of these factors eventually multiply to make m. So why not condense the notation and write m? And that way, you don't have to find the exponents. Why don't you? Why don't the exponents matter? Because they're not in the function. If you look, th the function phi of m is only a function of of m and a function of the primes. So while the exponents do matter in a sense because they're they're accounted for in this m, you don't have to explicitly use them. So here we are, we have defined phi of m as as this as this expression right there. And if if you guys want a application of this term, which I'm sure you would, let's let's consider an old Amy problem. Here's, here's, I'm going to, uh, to show you the solution to an Amy problem, 1983, number six. This is the American Invitational Math Exam. Now, they ask us to find the remainder of six to the 83 plus eight to the 83 when dividing by 49. And upon calculating, we can find that phi of 49 is 49, which is m, times 1 minus 1 over 7, which is 6 7. So 6 7 times 49 is 42. And by the Totient theorem, which is what I just what is that, what I just described, is 
uh, it yields that a to the 42 is congruent to 1, mod 49. And by using this fact, you can easily solve this problem. Just one of the many applications of this 